Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. In Star Wars there are a wide range of ships of all different shapes and sizes and with different types of armaments and defenses. Naturally there are going to be great disparities amongst all the ships in the galaxy, but if one is desperate enough to win or has no options left at their disposal, there is one equalizer that will level the playing field and that is engaging your ship at uh, full ramming speed. And so today we'll be taking a look at some of the best ship ramming operations in Star Wars. During the Old Republic era, it wasn't just the Sith and Republic trying to constantly kill each other. At one point in time, there was a third party that dominated the galaxy, a faction known as the Eternal Empire. They disrupted the balance in the galaxy and almost overwhelmed both the Jedi and the Sith at the same time. The Eternal Empire was actually commanded by the resurrected Sith Emperor known as Vitiate. He was probably one of the most powerful beings in Star Wars history, even more powerful than Darth Sidious. After the Eternal Fleet appeared out of nowhere and began raiding Republic and Sith worlds, Darth Mara, a Sith Lord and one of the greatest defenders of the Empire, pursued Vitiate into wild space, leading a coalition of Republic and Sith ships. But while en route, this fleet was ambushed by the Eternal Fleet. Darth Mara's flagship, a Terminus-class destroyer, was immediately boarded by enemy Sky Troopers, and the rest of the coalition fleet was soon placed out of action. Darth Maul had two options here, either to abandon his flagship or engage in full ramming speed. He of course does the latter and does an unproportionately large amount of damage with his flagship. The initial Republic attempt to break the Separatist blockade on Ryloth was a complete disaster, mainly because the Republic thought it would be a good idea to place the command of their entire Starfighter Corps in the hands of a teenage Jedi who disobeyed orders and left the entire Republic fleet undefended from enemy bombers. In order to rectify her mistakes, Anakin Skywalker has to pull off a completely illegal maneuver. Using the flag of truce as cover, Anakin Skywalker pretends to surrender himself on board a Venator-class Star Destroyer, ironically called the Defender. But once Anakin is close enough to the enemy's command vessel, a Lucre Hulk battleship, the Jedi engages ramming speed and jumps into an escape pod. The resulting collision throws Confederate forces into chaos, and the rest of the Republic fleet jump into action and mop up the survivors. Anakin wins this battle for himself, but for the rest of the war, it's going to be relatively hard for Republic naval officers to actually surrender now. The Sith are a ruthless and insecure bunch. When Darth Sidious begins fearing that Count Dooku's trusted assassin Asajj Ventress was becoming too powerful, the Dark Lord tells his apprentice to kill her. Unfortunately for Asajj Ventress, this order comes during the middle of the Battle of Solus. Her forces are fully engaged with the Republic, and she personally is having a knife fight with Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi, two of the finest pilots and duelists in the entire Jedi Order. While trying to hold off the two Jedi, Asajj Ventress is betrayed. The droid commander TJ-912 begins opening fire on the ship that Asajj and the Jedi are dueling inside. Once the shields are done, TJ-912 then orders a single hyena bomber to essentially fly into the hangar and kamikaze the Sith assassin. And it almost works, but the Jedi and Sith jump out of the way at the right time and abandon the Separatist command ship right before it explodes. When you go up against Thrawn, your forces are going to be blooded. You will be placed in uncomfortable positions and forced to sacrifice pieces of yourself in order to survive his tactical genius and strategic greatness. When Thrawn figured out the location of the secretive chopper base in the Autolon system, home of the Lothal rebel cell, he quickly encircled the system with a fleet of Star Destroyers, including two of the Empire's newest toys, the Interdictor-class Star Destroyer. These ships project artificial gravity wells, which prevent ships from jumping into hyperspace. I mean, in Legends, I recall you used to be able to take the limiter off of your hyperdrive so that you could jump through an interdiction field, but I guess that's no longer canon. And so once the interdiction field is activated, the rebels on chopper base have nowhere to go. To make matters worse, General Dodonna had arrived at the Atalon system shortly before in order to coordinate an attack against the TIE Defender factory on Lothal. General Dodonna had brought with him Masasi Group, the largest rebel fleet in existence at the time. If Thrawn could trap and destroy the rebels on chopper base, he could basically wipe out a good portion of the Rebel Alliance's naval assets. Seeing what was at stake, Rebel Officer Jun Sato, commander of the Phoenix Nest, a captured Imperial Quasar Fire-class cruiser carrier, decides to make the ultimate sacrifice. 
He understands that the Rebel ships don't have enough firepower to engage and destroy an interdictor class Star Destroyer, but engaging ramming speed should do the trick because it always works. Two brave Rebel bridge crew officers also volunteer to stay behind with their commander to carry out this kamikaze attack. Now, Admiral Constantine, commander of one of the interdictors, decides impatiently to charge a ship into the fray in order to confront the Phoenix Nest, against Thrawn's orders, of course. This makes his interdictor a much easier target to hit. The sacrifice of the Phoenix Nest allows a small group of rebels to escape Atalan to call for reinforcements. These reinforcements would return and destroy the second interdictor and allow the majority of rebel forces on Atalan to escape. Many of these rebel pilots and ships would actually go on to take part in very important battles like the Battle of Scarif and the Battle of Yavin 4, which would turn the rebel lines into a true opposition against the Empire. Next up is my personal favorite, the last ride of the Lightmaker. The Battle of Scarif was not going well for the Rebel Alliance. They had deployed their entire fleet on a slim hope that a small Rebel commando team could recover blueprints for a massive Imperial superweapon. The problem was the entire planet of Scarif was protected by a planetary shield, which not only blocked ships from reaching its surface, it also prevented data from being streamed off the planet to ships waiting in orbit. Admiral Raddus comes up with this brilliant plan. After a flight of Y-Wings manages to disable a Star Destroyer known as the Persecutor, Raddus calls up the Sphirna class Hammerhead Corvette Lightmaker, which up until then had been held in reserve after being damaged in the opening moments of the battle. The Lightmaker under the command of Kato Okon is tasked with ramming the disabled Persecutor directly into her sister's ship, the Intimidator, which made the mistake of positioning itself right next to the disabled ship. What results is a spectacular collision between the two Star Destroyers. The Persecutor slices through the Intimidator like a knife through hot butter, and then both ships fall directly into the planet's gravity well and crushes the shield gate. This allows Rogue One to fulfill their mission and beam up the Death Star plans to the Rebel fleet. Like every Rebel Alliance battle we covered so far, the Battle of Endor is also not going very well for this ragtag organization. The Rebel fleet was completely outnumbered when they engaged Palpatine's second Death Star. They essentially flew right into a trap, and their small fleet was quickly surrounded by a massive fleet of Imperial-class Star Destroyers on one side and a functioning Death Star on the other. At the head of the Imperial fleet was the Super Star Destroyer, the Executor, a 19-kilometer-long city-sized vessel. In the middle of the battle, Green Leader Arvel Krynit suffers massive damage to his RZ-1A wing. These ships were notoriously difficult to fly, and pilots who did fly them had relatively short lifespans. Instead of trying to save himself, Green Leader manages to plow his failing A-wing directly into the bridge of the Executor. Admiral Piet's commander of the vessel had made the mistake of keeping his ship too close to the second Death Star. Once the bridge was taken out, the Executor begins listing towards the Death Star and gets pulled into its gravity well. The resulting explosion is massive and life-changing for those caught in the explosion. That's one ship ramming into another ship, which causes it to ram into another ship. Good job, Green Leader. Lastly, we have the infamous Holdo Maneuver. During the evacuation of Dakar, the Resistance fleet finds himself being chased by a much larger and superior First Order fleet. Worse yet, the First Order has a supercomputer which can predict and follow the Resistance's hyperspace jumps. This means no matter where the Resistance goes, the First Order will be able to chase them down. Eventually, all of the Resistance fleet's support ships are destroyed, and all that is left is the Mon Calamari cruiser, the Rattus. Vice Admiral Holdo is in command of the ship, and she attempts to evacuate the remains of her crew on small transports onto a nearby planet known as Crate. But the First Order sees through her ruse and begins firing on all of these transports. Given no other choice, Vice Admiral Holdo turns her ship around and engages the hyperdrive on the Rattus and plows right through the First Order fleet, cutting Supreme Commander Snoke's flagship, the Supremacy, clean in half. This move would forever be immortalized as the Holdo maneuver. So there you have it guys, seven very inspiring ship ramming sequences. As you can tell when all options are off the table, launching your ship into another ship is oftentimes your best choice. Remember that. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.